tight. Wow. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Aaron, right. for joining uh, our class, Soft Bodies at University of Michigan. And uh, oh, is your connection working out? Yeah. Okay. Am I frozen? Are you in Berkeley? Yeah, I'm in Berkeley. I'm in Berkeley, South Berkeley. California. Very good. Uh, it looks like I am not a host, so I can't share my screen. Can you oh, okay. give me the privilege? For now. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Also, apologies in advance there. They seem to be demolishing a building across the street. So if it's loud, um, that's what's happening. Okay. So, okay. Can we see this here? Yeah. Okay. So I put together a little presentation, which is gonna be in two parts. Part one is gonna be some sewing theory. Part two is gonna be hopefully a short tutorial. Adam told me that you've already been sewing, you have machines, you've made bucket hats, which is great and also not easy. Um, so I'm gonna try to demonstrate a couple of what I would call like level two sewing techniques, um, but we'll get into that later. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk about scrap and structure, which basically is uh, about how I like to work with fabric and also different ways beyond just sewing two pieces of fabric together that you can manipulate uh, fabric structures and get them to do what you want. So I like working with scrap. I started making hats during the pandemic just with stuff I had lying around. Um, I think it's really nice when you just have a weird shaped piece and you have to figure out how to be as economical as possible and figure out what, what you can make, what you can do. Um, it's, it's just a nice place to start from rather than working with a, you know, big piece of yardage. Uh, my great grandfather had a hat store in San Francisco. This is in 1956 on Fillmore street. Um, this has all been demolished for a long time, but that's sort of where I'm coming from. This is an artist's rendering of me sitting where I'm sitting right now in my room at my sewing machine, sewing some hats. Um, so as I say, I like to work with scrap. So um, I'll just like at night, we'll cruise eBay looking for little off cuts, remnants, you know, people get to the end of a bolt of fabric and they sell just the little half yard or two thirds of a yard or just like weird pieces that people have left over from sewing projects. I'll just I'll buy that stuff and um, and then figure out like how to do something with it. So often the pieces are so small that, that they don't even make up one pattern piece. So then I have to decide um, how I'm gonna join them together, how I'm gonna you know, extend them so that I can use as much of the fabric as possible. You know, usually the, the weird off cuts between pattern pieces get thrown away, but that's the stuff that I like to use. Um, and then, you know, as I start to assemble a pattern and piece things together, the the aesthetic kind of follows or grows out of that. So, you know, like joining things this way inevitably is going to lead to some kind of expression, um, which I like to celebrate. So this is one way that I like to work. Uh, this is especially for what I call the scraps of the scraps or the scraps of the scraps of the scraps where I just have like the tiny pieces in a plastic bag. So this is a, a crown of a hat. Um, and there's a bunch of like shingled wool scrap pieces on one side. And then there's a backing of cotton muslin. And I just sort of sew them on there. Um, so that you can see on the right hand side, that's the back, uh, which is just this weird index of all these pieces that have been joined together to cover the entire surface. Um, Here's what the hat looks like. So often they're kind of like, you know, clean, messy, finished, unfinished, you know, sewn, finished edge, raw edge. And I like to play with those things uh, together. Here's another inside outside. Um, so this is one side of a hat. And then before I sewed the lining in, I took a picture just so you can see some of the like, you know, back of house 
structure stuff that's going on. But all these hats are made with really small pieces. Like I probably made two hats and then this was just the, the dregs of whatever was left over. Um, this one's made out of an old pair of jeans. And you can see on the left, uh, I basically took, like some of the pieces are right side out. Some of the pieces are, you know, wrong side out. So the the surged edge, which is the the way of finish one, one way of finishing a seam inside with what's called an overlock machine. Which I mean, if you like, if you have a industrially produced piece of clothing, chances are that the seams inside are finished this way. It's basically a ton of stitching done with this special machine, and it's a very characteristic like loopy thread that keeps the edges from fraying apart. Um, I think they look cool and they're always on the inside of a garment. So I turned it and put it on the outside. Uh, here's some more. This is a hat that my, my friend sent me a picture of his avatar from, uh, what was this? Wait, what is this from? It's like Wii Guy. It's Animal Crossing. Animal Crossing. Yeah, sorry. It's been a, <laughs> when was that in the pandemic when people were getting into Animal Crossing? It's been a minute. Um, thank you. I, yeah. yeah. Um, so he, he requested that I make his animal crossing hat in real life, which I did, um, out of this unbelievable golden Pendleton wool that came from a blanket that was like all cut up and it was like just enough to make the hat. So I'm doing a lot of, a lot of this kind of thing, which is like, I find a scrap with some dimensions. And then usually in SketchUp, I quickly lay out to figure out the, the yield and what I can get out of it. And that helps me decide, you know, is it worth it to get this? Is it not worth it to get this? Um, and, you know, the, like, uh, I mean, you've probably realized this already working with fabric. Fabric, like other materials like wood, has a grain. There's a grain line, which is a result of how the garment is woven. and if you're gonna sew something properly, let's say, um, the pattern pieces have to be oriented in a certain direction, either with the grain or against the grain or on the bias, which is when you orient it diagonally relative to the grain. And uh, orienting the pattern piece different ways gives that piece different characteristics in terms of how it behaves. Um, I sort of like throw all that stuff out the window and do what you can see on the right where like I'm cutting up a pair of pants and I lay out the pieces as close together as possible in whatever orientation they fit in. So as a result, the hats get kind of wonky and uh, you know they get sort of pulled and quilted in various ways, which are always unpredictable. Um, but I think I, I kind of like having this element of unpredictability, which is an outgrowth of the you know economy of working with random scraps because one inevitable result of laying stuff out on the grain line is there's a lot of waste and usually the waste just gets junked. Um, but that's partly why I can get some nice fabric for very little money. Um, there's a lot of precedents for different scrap hats. This is one of my favorite ones. This is a hat that, I don't know if they still do this, but the, the porters, the people who used to carry around big boxes or like carry a whole you know pig carcass on their shoulder um, in the Billingsgate market in London would wear these hats. They're called bobbin hats and they're made out of leather and there's basically a sole, like the sole of a shoe on top. And you know, over time it gets worn out when you're using it all the time. So they would just, you know, keep continually layering new leather, new fabric on top. And then these would be handed down. So some of the hats were like hundreds of years old. Um, I've never seen one of these or worn one of these, but I think they look amazing. Uh, prototyping, which I'm sure is relevant to your studio is relevant to my practice. I always make a prototype. Basically before I use the nice fabric, I use like, the worst fabric. And before I use the worst fabric, I usually use paper. So this is me, you know, working out a new pattern of a hat. I sew the paper pieces together, which I don't, you know, think you're supposed to do. I have a fairly uh, robust industrial sewing machine now, so I don't think it hurts it too much, but you can, you can sew paper uh, if it's thin. 
And it's a helpful way to just, you know, really quickly get some feedback, figure out, is this going to fit? Does the sizing make sense? Um, it doesn't simulate the draping of fabric at all. So there's some things you're only going to learn through working with fabric, but paper patterns are uh, really useful. What, what kind of paper are you using? Oh, uh, I think that was just, that was like construction paper. In fact, it looks like this, um, it looks like the graph paper from the place I worked two offices ago had these like notepads with graph paper. And it was printed on like slightly heavier than, it wasn't quite printer stock and it wasn't quite paper, like card stock. It was like in between. It's kind of like a nice heavy paper, but you can use, I mean, you can use whatever. Um, I think uh, the way that you join materials when you're sewing has some immediate analogies in architecture and you can steal one and use it for the other. And I think that goes both ways. So uh, I don't know, just, I mean, separately, I'm just, I'm like obsessed with shingles. I think they're unbelievable, just like absolutely brilliant. And um, I, this was a, just a prototype for a shingle hat, which is unfinished. And the part of it that's unfinished is kind of like the trickiest part of working with shingles, which is how to finish them out on top to make them all waterproof. So usually like if you do a shingle turret roof, you have some kind of finial that's made out of metal flashing, like, you know, lead or copper. So I think there's gotta be some kind of ornament that goes on top to finish this whole thing. This was another hat also, which I completely took apart and then cut all the pieces into shingles, which are scaled um, based on standard architectural shingle sizes. So they're, they, I just like figured out proportionally how much I needed to scale them down so that they worked at the scale of a hat and could conform to the curve. Um, I have those pattern pieces somewhere. It looks kind of like a ghillie suit. Yes, yeah, this is, <laughs> Um, this is what I use when I need to blend into my surroundings. <laughs> um, actually in Berkeley, it kind of works because everything is like cedar shingle. Uh, here's another one. This is, this was retroactive. I like was looking at this hat and then thinking about that's James Sterling. And I think Michael Gowan's book pavilion at, uh, on the Venice Biennale grounds from, sometime in the late 80s, I think, one of his last projects, but as this great, uh, it looks like a standing seam roof, but I think it's, I don't know, the, the, the seams look really chunky. So I don't know exactly how they did it, but I was, this was another one of these like snap decisions made in the process. I was sewing, this is the wrong side of this wool material. And so normally those, you know, the, the seam allowance would fall to the inside of the garment and it would just be a, a seam line on the outside. And I decided like, no, it looks better this way. I'm just going to do it. Uh, I'm going to, you know, invert it. So the, the seam becomes the expressive like rib element and that stays on the outside of the hat. Looks like that. Um, this is an aside. This is just another like uh, soft project at the architectural scale which I did with your instructor and with our friend Alex Spatzier a couple years ago. Um, we were asked to build a monumental entrance, or actually a series of entrances for this outdoor sculpture and art site in San Francisco, uh, which, and that, that makes it sound pretty like uh, established. It was, it was basically, their, their problem was that people thought it was a construction site, which it, it was at various times. Are you still there? Yeah, yes. Oh, you are? Oh. Okay. Um, they couldn't see the uh, line weights. They're just not, the TV isn't showing the line weights. Okay, does it look, it, it looks like, <laughs> okay. But um, I'm showing them on the my screen. Okay, my, cool. My computer screen. Got it. Okay. I mean, there's basically one line weight. It's sort of medium. <laughs> um, yeah. So people, people thought that the site was like an empty construction site. And uh, so they wanted to create very cheap structures that announced that there was actually a space there that they were welcome to come in. So when they approached us, they wanted three monumental entrances. 
very quickly that was value engineered down to one. And we proposed this triumphal arch made out of plywood. That was also too expensive. So what we ended up with was a monumental column, half of which was made out of plywood and half of which was made out of uh, ripstop, was this inflatable balloon, which effectively doubled the height of the structure. So we used an inflatable to get like a lot of bang for extremely minimal buck. And uh, we worked out, you know, all the details, how the thing was going to stand up. Everything was based on standard dimensions of plywood. That's sort of where we started from. And it was both, you know, very low tech, dumb stick framing and also very high tech. Uh, so it was all prefabricated offsite. Um, we mocked it up in place and then we painted everything and then brought it over in a truck, set up the plate and then framed it uh, in an afternoon. And then added the balloon on top. There was a polycarbonate uh, ceiling so we could light the thing underneath. And that's what it looked like. It was 16 feet tall. Uh, it was up for a lot longer than we thought it would be. And then at some point it was knocked down and they built apartments on this site uh, since then. And there it is. Oh, also it, I should say it, the sign on top, the, the balloon says open. So when the site is open, they blow up the balloon and it says open um, or it says nope, depending on how you walk around it. So inflatables, architecture, signage, all kind of working together to make this weird thing that people let us build. Um, okay, so now let's get into some sewing theory. So first we're gonna talk about structure. Um, so there's lots of ways to manipulate fabric beyond joining pieces together um, to achieve certain effects or properties and I think really no matter what you're doing with fabric, there's always going to be this like uh, kind of ornamental quality where the, the operations that you do, especially the ones that are more visible, become expressive and become ornamental. So I think like, you know, even if you're doing a process for a very specific reason, like you need to reinforce a specific part of a structure, a garment, whatever, there's always an opportunity for some expression. So I always like to like crank these things up and exploit them. So that, that's why I include this picture of Peter Falk in this John Castavetti's film where he's got this like super top stitched brim of a hat. Um, somebody sent me this image and said, this is what I want. And I said, okay, thank you. So I, this is just like something I've discovered. I really love top stitching, which is essentially just sewing on top of the garment where the stitch is visible. So the default stitch, as you probably learned from, so from the, the bucket hats you made or any sewing that you've done is internal. You don't see it, you hide the mess. So the stitch is on the inside, you have the seam allowance, and then you turn the garment out, you press it, and you don't see the seam, you don't see the, the evidence of the construction. And in most, uh, let's say like, commercial or industrially commercially produced garments um, that we wear, uh, the mess has to be hidden at all costs. So partly that's because the seams can fray um, if they're not reinforced or finished in some way. But also part of it is like, it looks, I, I guess we've been, um, we've been trained to expect to have like, you know, a finished product inside and out. Um, so top stitching, is basically, I mean, it, it can be, there's a wide variety of reasons that you would use top stitching. Um, I recommend all of you to like, if you aren't doing this already, uh, just like take some time and look at your, look at your clothes, look at your garments, look at the like clothing that you wear. And just like look at all the different types of stitches that are used to construct it, the different stitch lengths, um, how the pockets are sewn on, how the buttons are sewn on, how the uh, lining is sewn in, you know, are there exposed stitches? Are there concealed stitches? I mean, it's kind of like a miracle just looking at all this stuff, how much intelligence and technology has gone into uh, constructing these garments. Um, 
I mean, and a tremendous amount of exploitation goes into it for, you know, our like fast fashion lifestyle, but really uh, clothing is a technological marvel, I think. And uh, so spend some time with it. Also, uh, I recommend if you can taking apart one of your garments and laying it flat just to look at the pattern pieces. Um, I'm going to get into that a little later, but I think that's a really good exercise. Just like take something familiar, like a shirt, pair of pants um, that's worn out. You don't use it anymore. And then uh, very carefully, don't just like cut it with scissors, but use a seam ripper, open up the seams and lay it flat and just like look at the pattern pieces and see how they go together and then cut it up and make a hat with it. Um, so this is, this is a, you know, one of my hats. Um, and here the top stitching is both structural. Um, the hat, you know, is kind of floppy. And then part of it is highly structured, which is in part a way to get the brim to sit how I want to kind of stiffen and reinforce the curvature at the base. Um, but it also becomes an expressive thing. So I had two different thread colors, uh, one for the, the machine and one for the bobbin underneath. And then I would just alternate the sides that I was sewing on. So the, the colors of the top stitching alternate. So, you know, the, the sky's the limit basically. Um, so, you know, top stitching is kind of, in a, in a way, is, I mean, it's very similar to quilting and you can, impart all kinds of properties on the fabric by doing this by just by virtue of stitching together two layers or stitching together two layers with a with a filler in between like a batting um, which can you know create insulation it can reinforce I mean it's it's really amazing um, the difference just the 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 lines of stitching can make in the rigidity uh, of two pieces of fabric, you know, the hat, like when I'm, when I'm done sewing the pattern pieces together of a hat, it's like, it's floppy. And then you sew it together with top stitching and then it, it's a completely different appearance and feel. And, um, you know, sometimes the floppiness is good and sometimes the rigidity is good. And you, as, as you work, you kind of get a sense of like what you need, where, um, I like excessive top stitching. Um, so I usually just kind of go to town. Um, these are some insulated uh, Soviet cold weather trousers. I think they're called Vatniki. Um, and I think the, the, I mean, the stitching is, is like a quilting for insulation, but I, I mean, they just like, they look amazing. Like I want to get a pair of these. Here's another hat. This is our friend Sue. Uh, this is an example of what I was talking about earlier. <laughs> um, where because I don't obey the grain line rules, weird effects happen. So, and this is also the result of uh, sewing two unlike fabrics together. So the exterior shell of this hat is wool. The interior shell is a twill. And twill is a like a, a heavyweight cotton that has a diagonal weave, I'm pretty sure. The grain is diagonal. So something, I don't know exactly what was happening at the level of the the weaving, but there was some kind of pulling that happened between the outer shell and the inner shell when I stitched them together. And it led to this very weird, irregular kind of diagonal uh, quilting and pulling that was like different on every side. Um, Sue is, you know, comfortable with this kind of look. So uh, it's all good. This is, I just found this this morning. This is quilting on kind of a quasi architectural scale. This is a Japanese observation kite, apparently for fishing communities. So they would, uh, I think, basically like tie someone up to this kite and then 200 people would pull a rope to get this aloft. And then they would go look from the air for schools of fish for, you know, to tell them where to send the fishing boats. Um, but if you if you look at it closely, you can see the uh, the quilting and reinforcement of the different layer, the you know, the layer of the fabric membrane. So quilting, I mean, is a really good way to develop some strength from weak elements that are held together and reinforcing each other. So this thing has to be incredibly durable. It also has to be really light so it can fly with a person attached to it. So they opted for this kind of quilting with some you know rib backing fabric. Um, 
but you know, top stitching is kind of like at the at the scale of a garment, at the scale of furniture, top stitching is kind of the way to go. And as I say, it almost inevitably becomes this uh, like expressive uh, ornamental element. And just by changing the thread color, you can you can enhance the ornamentality. Pad stitching is another uh, form of garment reinforcement. This is a really old, extremely laborious technique that is used. I think it's used um, in many uh, applications. The one I'm most familiar with is called canvassing. So in suiting, that is, you know, making suits, uh, the traditional suit is what is called full canvassed. So it has this floating structural layer in between the exterior layer and the lining inside. And the canvassing gives it structure and body. And I mean, there's all kinds of like, uh, there's a whole discourse around the like traditional menswear and the traditional suit giving like creating this or artificially creating the structure of the ideal male form. I'm not super interested in that. I mean, I'm sure people are interested in that. People are also have like critiqued it and, and um, exploited it in interesting ways, but this is a way to create some like uh, rigidity where, where none exists. Um, and it's basically a, you take a horsehair canvas and then you make like hundreds or thousands of these diagonal stitches called pad stitches. And um, that creates the, um, the rigidity, it creates like the role of the lapel. Um, and apparently, I don't really know that much about this, but apparently like the, the, the nicest bespoke suits that money can buy, like they all have this kind of stitching, I think because it's so time consuming to do, but really I'm told there's no substitute and most mass produced suits now have a, um, a glued or fused interfacing, which is like the, the kind of mass market way to approximate this, but apparently it's never as good. Um, here is a car bonnet. Actually, what I don't even know what you call these, like a car cover that I walked past that had some really beautiful zigzag stitching. Um, so this was just, you know, their need to create a durable way to join pieces of fabric together um, and create reinforcing for the grommets. And um, I don't know, I think this is like, this thing is kind of amazing. I mean, a zigzag stitch is another classic way to create some strength and reinforcing. If you have a zigzag machine, I have a straight stitch machine, so I can't do a zigzag, but um, if you have, I don't know, the, the machines that you got, the, the Singer machines, can those do a zigzag stitch? I think they can, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, do some zigzagging. It's it's fun and it's strong. Um, so this is, I think, this is probably the most common world of interfacing and reinforcement now. Um, this is a brochure I found from looks like the 70s. Um, but this is when the kind of handwork is going out and the uh, like new, uh, fusible interfacing products are coming in. So now in your garments, chances are there is some amount of, usually it's like a plastic or nylon interfacing to reinforce selective parts of the garment that need some reinforcement. So the collar very commonly is reinforced with interfacing. The brim of a hat is typically interfaced. Uh, the cuffs are interfaced um, and you know, that, I mean, that's where it's typically used to create more shape or structure or stiffness. But I mean, as with all of these things, I think you can just like, you know, pick and choose and you take, you, I mean, hopefully you're starting to think about taking these techniques from sewing that have very consistent and very practical applications and just use them however you want um, in, you know, whatever you produce. So, and yes. Do you... Uh, do you mind like showing them what interfacing is like? like oh yeah. Um, let me let me see if I. Oh, sh I didn't include an image. Whoops. Do you want me to just Google it? Yeah, that's fine. 
or Google. Yeah, it's like it's a white. Uh, it's kind of plasticky. I mean, they make it in different weights. Um, it's the. I think in this image, it's the. Well, there's a bunch of different types. Yeah, sorry about that. Here, let me pull up some interfacing. Can you see this new tab? Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry about that. I mean, it looks like nothing. It looks like this. Right. And there's a shiny side and a dull side, and the shiny side is the adhesive. And you iron that with your iron down, and then that basically like fuses it to your fabric and creates some structure. This stuff is also, I think, why clothing wears out uh, now. I mean, also the like the fabrics have a lot of plastic in them and the plastic does not last, but the, in, the fusible interfacings, I think kind of eventually sort of wash out in the washing machine. Um, but you should, you should experiment with this stuff because it really uh, makes a difference. And um, you, yeah, you'll, you'll see very quickly when you use it or, you, you know, you can experiment with different weights and it's not, usually very expensive and you can buy small amounts of it but um it's just it's like this kind of magic like band-aid thing that you iron on and change the properties okay that's that part uh sewing patterns so i imagine and adam you can correct me if i'm wrong i imagine that part of the studio involves making a pattern or will it involve making a pattern uh Yes. Yeah. Uh, or something analogous to a pattern. Yeah. 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 Something. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, the you know, like the un the instructions or just the kind of unrolling of how your fabric artifact is made. Hang on, I'm gonna go mute for one second. Whoops. Oh no, never mind. Um, I have a bunch of patterns that I just uh I like you know save in a folder, um, or people send to me, and uh i think i mean they're they're kind of amazing uh graphics to to behold but they're also some of them are really nice because they're so simple like this tulip hat on the left is a one piece pattern and if you can get away with a one piece pattern that's great you will save so much time um the other one i like because it's basically instructions for someone to uh reproduce the pattern by hand so they give dimensions and then the curve you basically just freehand and you know it's like it's sort of it is what it is um most you know patterns come in like an envelope on this incredibly thin tissue paper and uh or on large pieces of like bond paper and then you trace the pieces very laboriously but these are kind of like minimal like diy patterns basically um i also like the patterns that are not straightforward or simple and are extremely abstract also the um some of the rendering techniques like this looks like just like graphite pencil or like absolutely nuts so um you know this i actually don't know what that is if anybody can read that maybe you can tell me <laughs> <laughs> it's nice I, whatever it i think it's some kind of like cold weather cow like hat that becomes a cowl or a scarf or something and then that thing on the bottom, I have no idea, but it looks amazing. This is an assortment of my pattern pieces. Um, there's some hats, there's a collar. I think the one on the top left is a mask. But I think what's nice about these is they're kind of unfamiliar in a way. Like it's not immediately obvious what uh, what they produce, um, you know, especially once you add the, the seam allowances in. And you know you can see all kinds of little markings and annotations I make for myself about sizing and you know where I'm like working with a sharpie to modify the pattern things like that. Um, and I mean the the analogy to architectural drawing is obvious, but I think there's you know important differences between sewing patterns and architectural drawings. You know on the left is like those are your implements that you use to make architecture everything more or less is based on uh, rectilinearity and rectangular references, not always, but usually things have to be, uh, you know, constructible and somebody has to pull a tape, you know, or use a framing square 
kind of like figure it out. And, um, you know, like architecture is existing in the Cartesian world, more or less. Um, even though we have powerful software that can make all kinds of weird shapes. Um, and I haven't used Clo, but it looks extremely cool. Um, it's like, even in, you know, in Rhino, we are in a Cartesian world. We have our origin with X, Y, and Z. Um, and on the right is like, you know, those are the, the most basic implements for drafting a pattern or taking someone's measurements because we're making architecture for our body, which is basically a series of weird tubes. And that creates a completely different paradigm and way of thinking. And, you know, not only are we creating these tubes, but we're creating tubes out of flat material and we're giving shape to flat material, which is a very challenging and, and interesting process. But because we have to take this flat thing and, uh, you know, tease it and, and uh, modify it to accommodate a curved thing like our body, um, you know, the, the, you have to use like basically flexible measuring implements. The thing on the bottom is called a very form. And I've never used one of these, but I, I've seen people use them. Basically, when you're drafting a pattern by hand, uh, usually there are no straight lines um, on the like the boundaries of the garment. Usually everything has a slight ease, a slight curvature. So this is like, I mean, it's basically, I think, like a French curve that you use to join uh, edges together in a smooth way so you don't get any areas of flatness or, or excess of fabric in the garment where you don't want them. Um, if you haven't already, try and get your hands on a pattern. Uh, you know, you can find these things online usually. Um, although some, I mean, usually people want you to pay, but there's, there's free stuff out there. Uh, and I mean, what I love about patterns is like people were figuring this stuff out way before unroll surface, but basically every pattern is just an unroll surface command from Rhino, um, but for your garment. And that's that's why I encourage you to do an unroll surface on like your shirt, uh, you know, to like, uh, it's the same amount of defamiliarization as you do when you like unroll your crazy geometry and like when it's flat, like what, you know, how's that, how's that work? But um, this is a, a sleeve for a shirt that you're looking at. Um, so the curvature of the cuff um, or the, the, the shoulder cap where it joins up with the body of the shirt gets kind of flattened. And you can see, I mean, there's all kinds of information you can see in this pattern. The, um, the offsetting is, that's like how sizing works. So uh, it's probably too small to see, but you can see, you know, 42, 44, 46, 48, like all the sizes are written and the the sizing basically involves just like a scaling out a uh, proportional scaling of the edges um of the pattern piece and this is their economical way of getting a bunch of sizing all on one sheet they just layer it on top one on top of the other um there's the arrow for the grain line there's these notches that are cut this is a super useful technique um especially when you're doing complex operations and things that have to be aligned. Um, as I'm sure you've seen making the hat, actually, I think the tutorial talks about this, like making notches for alignment that help you, especially when you're working with curves. Um, it helps to have little notches, little carrot cutouts that you can line up. So you know that you're uh, like, you're, the pieces are, are aligned properly. Um, and sleeves are notoriously complicated. I've sewn sleeves on backwards, like everybody does it. Um, but that's why you do the one, one notch in the front, two notches in the back. And so when you go to put the thing together, you know that everything is kind of in the right place. Um, getting the notches to line up when you pin them is another issue. Um, I just include some images of, of historic patterns. Again, it's like, it's nuts to me that people were figuring this stuff out by hand before there was unroll surface or clo uh, or anything like that. And it's just this, you know, it's an index of measurements you take on the body and then you transfer those to the drafting surface. And then you, you know, with your rulers and curve forms, you, you fill in and construct the garment. Um, I think it'd be amazing, especially in your studio as you're making, uh, 
an architectural scale, furniture scale garments or fabric pieces to like unroll them and, and um, look at them all that way. Patterns also get uh, very abstract, which is not so useful when you're trying to make something, but just when considered as images, they're kind of amazing and can be misinterpreted. Um, these are both from a Western shirt pattern, but like if you zoom in, it's kind of hard to tell exactly what's going on or what kind of garment exactly is being suggested. Um, so I just include those in there. And you can also, of course, modify patterns, um, you know, as you go. So, I mean, this is a very simple example um, of something I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, this is like a basic pocket and I modified it to include a pleat. A pleat is basically an excess of fabric that gets folded and ironed um, to create some fullness in the jacket, in the in the garment, or or create movement, or um, you know, just to be used as a kind of expressive element. So, looks like that. Basically, you can you can see there's a there's a line down the center of the pocket, which is the where the fabric is kind of folded over itself. That's called an inverted box pleat. Um, so, a little more about pleats. Uh, the pleat is, I mean, there, there's ways of, there's a lot of ways of controlling um, fabric and the drape of fabric and how fabric moves with you when you move or how it conforms to the curves of the body or how it doesn't conform. So there's like, there could be a fit or there could be an anti-fit. And the pleat is kind of on the, the side of, you know, excess and fullness and, uh, you know, it's a, like, um, it sort of allows the garment to flex and move without pulling. Um, and uh, almost always it becomes a kind of expressive or excessive element. Like here in the forties, there were all these jackets with like four or five or six pleats in the back, um, which are about something very practical, which is, you know, being able to move your arms freely and not be constrained by the garment, but they also become this like ornamental thing. Um, and this is what they look like, which is basically exactly what a standing seam metal roof looks like. I always like finding these analogies and, you know, totally different purpose, but, uh, but also that, you know, there's some similarities about like the, you know, hiding the, crimp or hiding the seam. So you have the finished appearance on the outside when you're making a pleat or when you're making a crimp in a sheet metal roof, um, you need to hide the seam so that it becomes waterproof and you know becomes a solid joint. But um, there are many ways of working with building materials that are like directly analogous, I think, to working with fabric. Uh, just some more examples of pleats. Lots of ways you can do them. All of them have, you know, different visual effects. And uh, this is where pattern making really comes in handy because you have to kind of plan these things out. You have to know how much fabric you need when you're finished and then how much excess fabric to add in so that you can then, you know, fold it in on itself and iron it and then, you know, sew it in place. Actually, the, the pleat usually is not sewn. It's usually just ironed or it's, it's pressed. Um, it might be secured at the top just so it doesn't come apart, but usually it's just a process that's done with ironing. Um, there's like a ton of different ways to finish seams. I was talking about this earlier. Um, you can not finish them at all, which is something I often do. Um, but you can also, uh, you know, like if you look on the right, like there's an overlocked seam you can see different kinds of finished seams. Um, and again, this is like partly about creating something that's secure so a garment will last a long time and it won't start fraying apart. Because if, if you cut a piece of fabric and you just kind of leave it, leave the, the cut edge, um, it'll start unraveling, especially with repeated wear. So part of it is practical, part of it is hiding the mess. Um, but again, this like, I think these things look cool and weird and, and can be uh, exploited and, and reversed and celebrated. So um, 
it sounds to me like the studio is not, I mean, you're not learning to sew garments professionally. You're learning to make, to do like experimental architecture with fabric. So I don't know how relevant seam finishing is going to be, but you know, it's just as a way of learning processes um, or expressive ways to join material. What's that? More, it's just more tools for. for yeah, exactly. Process. Yeah. For Everything I'm showing you is, is a tool and it's a tool that has specific applications in the world of garment making, but like, it's just, a, it's a tool, just like a, you know, a sewing machine is a tool. Um, and I mean, my intent is to just like show you this stuff and then for you to take it and run with it and do, you know, whatever you want. Um, it's a way of making structure. It's a way of making excess or, um, you know, it's a way of making ornament. So, um, I, I think about this, the, the analogy to architecture here is like you have a very simple practical problem you have to solve. And then it, you know, the, the solution, the accumulating solutions over time get more and more and more elaborated and gradually become ornamental or in some cases like completely ornamental. So, you know, in seam finishing, the, the job is to finish the seam, to hide the mess. And like when you're casing a window or a door, it's the same thing. You are like hiding the messiness of construction, the gaps between the frame and the finished opening. And you can do it with like a simple board or you can do it with an incredibly elaborate casing with, you know, moldings and plinth blocks and sills and like, you know, cornices and all this stuff. So, um, you know, like the, the practical thing inevitably i think becomes kind of ornamental and becomes an opportunity for expression um and you know some of these are probably familiar to you whether you realize it or not like the you know the classic pair of denim jeans has this like very specific it's called a flat felt seam it looks like this and the you know this has become iconic this particular way of finishing the seam with two parallel lines of top stitching and then it gets this like I don't even know, bumpy effect in between um, as a result of the, the sewing process. So, uh, but you know, this is, this is like a reinforcing stitch. This is about making a really solid stitch that's not gonna come apart. Um, like I said before, take a look at your garments, see what kind of stitches are there, see what kind of seams are there, see how the seams are being finished. Um, this is a pair of military surplus overalls I have. Um, and I was just, I, I was taking them apart and tailoring them, but before I took them apart, I was photographing them so I could remember how they were put together the first time. Um, but it's just, it's kind of amazing once you start getting this buildup of layers of fabric, um, how complex and kind of beautiful things can get. Um, okay, last thing is the dart. So, Whereas the pleat is about creating excess and fullness in the garment, the dart is kind of the opposite. The dart is basically this uh, like diamond, elongated diamond shape that you plot on a garment where you want some area of curvature. You want to kind of remove fabric and you sort of sew along the midline. And, you know, darts are pretty common. A very common one is on the backside of your trousers. There maybe is a line extending up between the pocket and the waistband, that's a dart. And that's just a way to create some, um, to, to get the fabric to kind of like pull and conform to, I mean, to your, your curvature. Um, th this is a solution that has been devised to basically deal with the, the problem of like the flat thing becoming the 3D double curve thing is using darts. And I mean, these like, there's standard places where you would use these to create, to like pull the fabric and create some shape in a controlled way. But again, this is something you could use like any number of places, um, use or misuse. So that's a dart. And um, I mean, all these things, there's like a million YouTube tutorials, how to sew a dart, how to sew a dart so it doesn't pucker at the end, how to, you know, iron a pleat. Um, and that's how I learned how to sew is like, going on YouTube and watching the videos a bunch and sewing along with them. So that is what I recommend to you. And now let's 
do a little tutorial. How are we doing for time? Um, just, you know, uh, do your thing. Do your okay. Thing. All right, yeah. cool. So um, I thought it would be kind of tough to do like a sew along. So um, I don't think you'll need your, I don't know. Do you, I'm, just, do, I'm, just, do, I'm just wondering how long, how long is this uh, tutorial? It could be like five minutes, 10 minutes. Okay. Is that? Sure. I'm, I'm just wondering if, if it was going to be, you know, if you needed to take a break or not. Oh, I mean, I don't need to, if they need to take a break, that's fine. I mean, maybe, maybe while I get oh, set up. Good. We can keep going. We're good. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let me um, stop sharing my screen. Okay. So let's see. So it's a little dicey here. I actually don't know how people who make sewing tutorials <laughs> set up. They, I mean, they probably have cameras, but like I have this uh -huh. stack of we books. Can... You can see. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. So um, I made one. Okay. So I'm going to show two things. I'm going to show top stitching and specifically like using your presser foot as a guide. It's actually a lot of glare. Hang on one sec. Okay, how's that? Let me try to move this in. The trick is like getting the camera close enough, but also being able to sew. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'll do my best. These are also things that uh, you can find online, but I figured I would just kind of talk through it. So um, one process is just going to be top stitching using the presser foot as a ruler, basically. And the other is just going to be um, a useful top stitching technique for uh, like turning on a dime, basically. So if you're not sewing on a continuous curve and you have to like turn the fabric, there's just a there's a specific way to do it, which will take a minute to show. Is that is that new yeah. stuff? Is that like is that useful or is that stuff you've already done? Would you would you all like to know about this? Yes. OK. Also, <laughs> are there before I get into this, are there questions from the lecture or do you want to do those at the end? Why don't we just um, maybe they'll have questions at the end? OK. Yeah. OK, so let's do the tutorial. All right. So I made the bucket hat from the tutorial you did um, sort of up to the point where that tutorial ends. And now I'm just going to show you how to reinforce the brim with lines of top stitching. So um, basically, uh, if I zoom in here, I mean, you're now sort of familiar with, with uh, the machine and the presser foot. And um, the, I mean, what I want to impart to you is that the, the presser foot is an extremely useful measuring device. You kind of measure as you go. Um, so you can like align your sewing piece to the edge of the foot or to one of the prongs of the foot. And you just sort of learn from experience, like, okay, this is going to give me a quarter inch offset. This is going to give me an eighth of an inch offset. This is going to give me a 16th of an inch and you use it accordingly. I almost never look at the gauge on the side of my table here with the you know quarter inch, half inch, three quarter inch. I just use the presser foot to eyeball things. Um, so, all right, let's go for it. Oops. Okay, so I'm going to turn my machine on. So what I'm, sh what I'm showing you is kind of a quick and dirty top stitching. There's lots of different ways to do it. There's like proper ways to start and stop your seams. I'm going to not do those just in the interest of time. Um, but you can, you can find other tutorials where people will teach you how to do like a really clean top stitch. So can we see here? Um, it's, it's kind of blurry. Uh, really? Okay. Can you just like, put the camera like right next to the presser foot? Uh, it's on, you know what? I have an external webcam, maybe. Well, no, that I don't know if that's gonna work. I should have thought of that. Let's see. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how much detail we need to see. Yeah, how about it's kind of on the wrong side? Sure. 
that's clear. clear. It's okay. Is that better? I think it's a little better. All right. Sorry, this is like not Zoom friendly. Okay. You're. You okay. Know. Yeah. Doing okay. our best. Okay. So I, I basically have my my presser foot aligned right on the edge of my brim there. Uh huh. And I mean this this basically just involves very slowly and carefully working my way around and using that edge of the presser foot as a guide. Mm -hmm. So I, I just start stitching and top stitching. It's, it's kind of, um, it's easy to go fast, but it's actually really nice to go slowly. And I often will have one hand on the garment and one hand on the, the wheel over here. And sometimes I will like even walk manually just so I, you know, if I'm going around a curve, I do it carefully. So, and this machine goes, can go extremely fast. So it's good to just kind of take your time. So, it basically just, Follow your line and um, and when you come to the end, this is where the wheel and like manually walking the machine comes in handy. So I like to just sort of walk the last few stitches. And then here, um, there's a number of ways to end. Uh, when you're top stitching, I mean, usually you don't want to do a, a back tack where you sew over your stitch like you would do if you're sewing on the inside of the garment, um, just because you get a kind of bunch up of fabric or of thread. Um, I use a kind of shortcut, which is turning my stitch length basically to a one, you know, as low as it goes. And then I just do like a really small back tack like that. So the, the, uh, the, the stitch is secure, but um, it's you can't really see it. So if you can see, that's what it looks like. Yep. You just get your parallel yeah. line. So um, if you do that like hundreds of times, you'll get extremely good at it and really fast, and you can do it to your heart's content. Um, anybody have any questions on that? Sorry, it's like. Ideally, you'd be sitting exactly where I'm sitting so you could see what I see. Mm -hmm. um, but probably on YouTube, there's some tutorials with production value and they'll show you what you need to know. Um, we've got some sleepers in the back row. I don't oh no. Questions. Wasn't that boring? Coffee. Do you need some coffee? All right, any questions for Aaron? Right. I have yeah. a question about when to use two pieces of fabric versus like my shirt, for example, is one piece of fabric with the edges. Yeah. Over them. When, when would you, is there a good rule of thumb for using two versus one? Uh, really depends. I mean, yeah, the, sh the shirt is usually going to be one piece. I mean, two pieces can be useful if you want to hide, hide stuff on the inside. If you want it to be a warmer garment. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons. Um, I think with a shirt, let me turn this off. Uh, with a shirt, it's it's just about expediency and cost. Like the shirt is probably one piece of material because that's all you need. But when you have one piece, then you have to deal with finishing all the seams on the inside um, because you can, you know, if the if you're wearing the shirt unbuttoned, then you can see into the inside of the garment. And um, I assume the seams are finished in there in some way. Yes. Yeah, how are they finished? Um, two, I, my, I don't have the right legs now, but two, you know, straight seams. Mm -hmm. so two, two straight seams, that's what he said. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was probably folded over, oops, and then folded over again, and then ironed, and then sewn along the seam. And that gives you, and that's that's part of why you have seam allowance. You you know, you leave the excess and then you can, it's enough fabric for you to fold twice and then sew. So you hide the, 
the cut edge, you know, well on the inside and like lock it in place. Is that, is that similar to the image you showed of the denim? Yeah, that's that's a flat felt seam. That's like a little, that's two lines of stitching. The the most basic uh the most basic finished seam inside is it's two folds and one line of stitching. It's also a way that you can sew only on the inside of the garment and the, the stitching does not need to telegraph to the outside of the garment. So you can finish the seam in, uh, inside and not see it outside. The flat felt seam is a way of finishing outside what is inside, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yes. Okay. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Is a dart something that you would be able to, like that you would sew while you're making the piece or could you put one in after the fact or is there uh, but you I mean it's like it's kind of a question of access like it's always easiest if you can do it in advance when you have when the the fabric is open like if you've ever tried to sew a patch on a machine onto a pair of pants it's pretty hard because especially a machine that doesn't have a like you can't um like some machines you can use for like cuffs where they have like a the table comes off and you can put a round thing on the machine i don't have that so um i sort of i like can barely do that process or it's really messy so it's the same thing like once you've enclosed the garment it becomes much harder to work on um so if you can it's always nice and the, the dart is usually like in a if you're sewing from pattern usually one of the first things that you do is sew the darts closed and sew the pockets on it's all these things that it's nice to do once you have access and there's not a ton of like you know other fabric pieces that you have to work around and potentially like sew together by accident um so mm -hmm. i would say ideally you, you plan the dart ahead of time but it is i mean it's basically you're just gathering fabric and sewing it on the inside so it is something you can do after the fact, but also it's tough. I mean, it's also tough to draw and plot on fabric that's not flat because you can't lie it flat, you know, to draw or to you know, make a measurement. So I would say if possible, try and try and plan. But, you know, if, if, if the studio is about like experimentation and messiness and you're just trying to like change something, just, you know, do it, do it when you want. Yeah, you just might need to like, uh, rip the seams apart to open up whatever you're working on. Yeah. So you just lose a little bit of time in sewing and then you can yeah. cut the Sewing, yeah, I mean, don't be afraid to rip the seams open. I know it's yeah. it feels counterproductive because you're like undoing your work, but like sometimes you just gotta rip the seam. And, you know, if you're experimenting, use a long stitch length. So if you have to rip it open, you're you're pulling out you know, you're spending less time picking out tiny seams. Use like a four or five uh, stitch length. Yeah, and also um, it's actually pretty easy to like rip seams out and it doesn't damage, the, it does not damage the fabric. Unless yeah. Sometimes, sometimes it can, but usually, I don't know, it's fine. But yeah. um, if you just like, when you're using the seam ripper, you can just like not, you can cut it in basically two, to like at the beginning and the end and then you can just basically pull it out like so you don't yep. have to like go one by one by one by one and pull out tiny little pieces you can just cut it at both ends and then you can just pull it right out and it's pretty fast that's right uh, do you have a question yeah is there like a rule of thumb for um like you showed the uh, the car cover earlier about mm -hmm. with the with the zigzag stitching mm -hmm. um are there specific like reasons to use that kind of stitching versus another or like i mean in general i think our machines have a couple of different settings. yeah yeah um i don't know exactly yeah. like mechanically what is happening with the zigzag stitch i think it's about surface area it's distributing the like the um just the, the surface area of the stitch across more material so it's getting that material to like work um so when it's being pulled it's it's being distributed and it's not creating just like a single line of stress so and you know you can um modify the the width of the zigzag but like i don't think there's any real rule of thumb about 
you know, what, what stitch you need for what purpose. It's all just, it comes down to experimentation. Right. That makes sense. Okay. Is it possible to like, I mean, our thing with the, uh, there's like a dial where you could change the stitching mm -hmm. type. Um, what happens if you like move the dial in the middle of a, um, like, can you do it like while you're stitching or is it? Uh, yeah, I, I think, I don't think it's like changing the gear on your bike if you're not pedaling, like it, you know, it screws everything up. I think you can, I mean, the, you'll see when you, when you turn on the zigzag stitch setting, it moves the needle over so that it can do this. Whereas, you know, when you're doing a straight stitch, the needle is dead center. So it might just create a weird, uh, like jog in your line of stitching, but yeah, you can, I mean, I, I actually think there are some machines do like a preset, like straight stitch, zigzag stitch, straight stitch, zigzag stitch, or like there's like different kinds of stretch stitches. I mean, there's, there's lots of these things. I, my machine does one stitch really well, really fast, you know, it'll go forever. Um, so I don't use any of these like other types of stitches, but you can, you know, you can do lots with a, with a zigzag. I mean, you could probably simulate the pad stitching, which I showed earlier for like a suit canvas, um, just by doing many parallel rows of zigzag stitching. Gotcha. So if you do the stitch, like Dominique and I were messing with it, and you can just like pause, like you're sewing, and you have to like change your thread and just change the knob and then keep going. Okay. Yeah, I was trying to just like break it. No, like, no, yeah. Okay. It, it feels like it's like relenting to do it, but like it's fine. Okay. It feels like you were doing it while moving though. Like, Dude, yeah, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do that. Because like yeah. it, it, Definitely it's, don't do that. it's like, it feels like changing a card you're kind of like, in, yeah. there's a little bit of like, like movement. Like you throw your card in reverse real quick or something while you're driving. That yeah, matter. I would say the only thing is you like when you get to the if when you get to the end of a line of stitching, you want to just make sure that you've secured it in some way. So you've either back tacked or um you know left yourself long ends that you can tie because that's where your stitch is going to become unraveled if you if you just you know take the needle out change threads, put it back in, like there's going to be a kind of weakness in that zone. So the easiest way is when you start again, you just do another back tack. So you, you go over the end of the, your previous line of stitching and then you start your new one. You know what I mean when I say back tack? I'm just throwing that. Um, I think some people will know. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's totally fine. If not, the, the back tack is basically when you start a row of stitching, you start going forward and then you reverse the, the machine and you sew backwards and then forwards again. And that's a way to just, you know, lock the stitch in place. Cause if you just sort of dive into the material and start going the, it's very easy for the stitch to, to come out um, where you start. So back tack just locks it in place. It's also, I think called a lock stitch. Yeah, Laura, Laura showed you that, um, how to do that. If you remember oh true um cool any more questions this would be a good time to ask since you are probably making models right now some of which will require sewing i also have one other process i can show very quickly okay if you want sure. okay this is i mean this is like this is a minute okay so this is just like if I want to sew something that's not a nice continuous curve, if it's got changes in direction, this is how I would do it. So, let's see. Okay, so if I want to sew a top stitch and then I want to turn at 90 degrees, what I'm going to do is make sure that my needle is down in the material and then I'm going to raise the presser foot. And what this does is it basically, the needle acts like a pin and, or like a pivot and it keeps the fabric in place. And then I can turn it freely. And once I have it where I want it, I drop the foot again and I keep sewing. And then, you know, when I come to the next corner, drop the needle, raise the foot, turn. And if I'm trying to sew like a closed shape, I, again, like, like I showed you in that last process, I always have my hand on the wheel 
And so those last few stitches, I, I do, I sort of regulate the speed of the machine. It might be less relevant with your machines, which are, I think they're not like full industrial, so they don't easily like spin out of control. But this one just like, if I apply even a little bit of pressure, it just goes so fast. Um, so I have to really like manually advance it with my hand, but it's, you can do it on your machine also. So like if I wanna close this, whoop, there we go, and I went too far. Um, but I, I try to do those last few stitches just with, by hand, um, walking the machine, as I call it. So it closes nicely. Um, so that's a super useful technique that you can use. Was that, could you see that at all? Yeah, yeah, that was good. Okay, cool. Thank so you. yeah, drop the foot or drop the needle, raise the foot. And uh, and then turn and drop the foot again and repeat. You can make uh, nice cool. What's that? You can make nice drawings with your top stitches. Yeah, you can you can do all your final drawings on the sewing machine. Yeah, maybe maybe you will. I don't know. You might do there's, it. There's there's a <laughs> Japanese artist who makes like beautiful uh beautiful like you know sunset images all with sewn silk on the back of track jackets can't remember their name <clears throat> but it's like drawing drawing with the sewing machine i mean i guess that's what embroidery is yeah you can get um, an embroidery embroidery i think it's called a free motion presser foot it basically allows you to like coast on the sewing machine and use it as an embroidery machine but you can do it with a conventional sewing machine. Oh, that's cool. Do you have one? I don't have one, but I hear that you can do this. Well, if anyone wants to do that, might want to buy one of those. Um, yeah. Do you have any tips for them while they're in the garment district in LA? <laughs> uh, I mean, just like, I don't know what kind of access you're going to have, but I mean, people who like make garments for a living are, they really know their stuff. And, uh, you know, I mean, what, what amazes me about industrial garment production is they don't use pins at all. They just sew and they like, I mean, they're just, they're like perfect. I don't know how they do it. Um, it's just amazing to me the, to watch like the speed and the accuracy that people have who have just, who've been doing it forever. Mm -hmm. um but you know using pins uh is 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 all good also something i learned very late in the game that i wish i'd learned earlier is the proper way to pin so i would like if i wanted to join these two brim pieces together you know i would always pin like this like kind of sideways along the seam it's much easier to pin perpendicular to the seam like that that makes it easy to pull the pin out or actually on, on this machine, I just sew over the pins, um, which is not recommended, but you know, if you have a, if you have a pretty sturdy machine, it's not the end of the world, but um, pinning like this, uh, you know, normal to the curve rather than along the curve uh, is much easier. And the, um, you can get a much more precise fit when you're pinning the two pieces together. So I wish somebody had told me that earlier. Thank you. That is a good tip. Yeah, use use pins. Use basting. Basting is, um, I mean, you can machine baste, but basting is basically sewing a temporary stitch, like a long temporary stitch by hand, when pieces are really difficult to pin together. So you just, you know, you just sew them by hand, um, and it can be a loose and messy stitch. You don't have to like really tie it, um, but that's also a useful way. I mean, like. Making the hat, I think one of the hardest processes is getting a precise seam between the crown and the brim. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's hard to pin that joint. So that's actually something that I would tend to baste. And then once you've basted it, you can put it on the machine and sew right next to your, uh, your temporary basting stitch. And then once you're done, you just take out the basting stitch. It's much, much uh, easier to work on the machine, even though it takes the additional time of, you know, sewing by hand. 
Yeah. Get a thimble, save your hands, get a thimble, learn how to use a thimble. Um, super useful. Anyone have a thimble? No one has a thimble. You should get a thimble. <laughs> if you can afford it, if you can afford it, get, get one studio thimble, get Adam to, to go to Joanne's and get you a, get you a thimble. All right, I'll, I'll put my own money into it. I'll buy a thimble. Yeah. Everyone can share it. Um, <laughs> wait, but I mean, they're not expensive. It's just a little piece of metal. Yeah, they're not expensive. Um, do you have a thimble? Do I? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Where is it? It's in my drawer. It's right here. Well, why didn't you use it when you were sewing? Because I wasn't sewing by hand. Okay, okay. I used it, you use it to, you wear it on your middle finger when you sew by hand and you, it helps you press the needle through, especially when you're using thick material, you can really mess up your hand uh, very quickly, just, you know, so the thimble, the thimble is great. Do you, would you ever use it with your, when you're sewing with your machine? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Just by hand. Yeah. So, but there's some stuff you you can't do on the machine. There's some stuff you got to just do by hand. Mm -hmm. Okay. I got another question. Yeah. How yeah. Did you, what material was? Did you just use chalk to mark your fabric for your sewing oh. lines? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, Taylor's chalk comes out in the wash usually, so it's good. I don't like it because I mean, it the line it makes is like an eighth of an inch thick or more you know three sixteenths of an inch so there's a lot of slop in that line um i mean people who are really good uh you know are very disciplined about sharpening you can sharpen your chalk with a pair of taylor shears like the like just like a big pair of scissors um so that would probably solve my problem but yeah i use i use taylor's chalk if it's if it's something for me i will sometimes use a pencil I made the mistake of using a pen and then you, you can see, you know, the pen leaks through. Um, there's like fabric markers. Uh, just find what works for you. But, you know, take into account, like if you have a pattern piece and the pattern piece is the exact size that you need, and then you're using the chalk around it and you're starting to get a thick line, you know, just remember to cut to the inside of the line um, just to account for the extra. Cause you can, you can cut out a whole pattern and then, by the time you go to fit the pieces together, you've accumulated like a quarter inch or half an inch of error and then things don't line up properly. And sewing is kind of forgiving. Like you can, um, you can stretch things or kind of bundle them and ease them, but pretty soon you're going to start getting weird puckers and folds and stuff that you don't want usually. So yeah, I usually use chalk. I have some really worn out pieces of yellow chalk that I use. Cool. Yeah, you can also use a marking stitch. This isn't really for the pattern pieces, but if you have to, um, if you have to transfer markings from one piece from one side to the other side, for example, a really good way, especially things that are not on the edges of the garment but are in the field somewhere, a really good way to do it. And tailors have been using this forever. Is a marking stitch. You're basting, but you're basically basting in a straight line, and um, you you basically follow a line that's marked on one side of the garment and it transfers it to the back to the opposing piece and then you cut all the seams and it create basically like a dashed line in the fabric with thread mm. yeah it's that's it's amazing it's very simple and very effective that's a good tip for some uh mirrored pieces yeah yeah, yeah. and and like I mean, I'm sure you saw when you were cutting the, the hat pieces, like the, the pattern in fact said, you know, place this on the fold. So when you're cutting patterns that have repetitive pieces that have mirrored pieces, you, you know, fold the fabric stock in half, you use the, the fold line, you fold it in half and you get two pieces for the price of one when you, you know, cut them out. So there's all these like time saving and accurate, accuracy improving processes that you can use when you're doing your layout and you know doing your cutting because otherwise cutting can take forever yeah thank you yeah oh one one more thing um use the iron as uh -huh. not i mean people say use the iron as much as you use the sewing machine that's maybe an exaggeration but use the iron 
finish your seams, it actually makes a difference. Um, take the time to like, you know, press your seams. Uh, it like the, the quality of the, of whatever you're sewing improves dramatically. If you take the, just take the time, if you have your ironing board and your iron set up and ready to go, you just like, you know, spend a little bit of time just finishing out the seam, especially if you're doing things like top stitching, it's nice to have everything lying flat and being pressed where it needs to be before you go and stitch. Do you, do you, yeah. Okay. Does that mean before you stitch and then after you stitch? Uh, depends. I mean, it's kind of a continual process when you're sewing something, sewing, ironing, sewing, ironing, sewing, ironing, but um, you, there, like, it is a good practice to finish a seam right after you've sewn it or to press it open. Usually it's like you're sewing the seam and then you press open the seam allowance and then you finish the seam in some way or you top stitch in some way, but it's good because when you're sewing and you have like the unfinished seams inside, they get in the way or they, you know, they get caught in a line of stitching that you don't want. Do you want to, uh, do you want to, do you have something you could show them that you're describing? Uh, I don't have my iron set up right now. That would be I, okay, I don't know. I mean, I that's fine. Oh, don't worry about it. Oh, like a finished seam? Yeah. Uh let's see. Let me you think. Clothes, right? I do. I think I would say go to your go home to your closet and and spend a little bit of time just like looking at your garments and how they're put together. I think that's a that's an education in itself. Look at a pair of pair of pants. Look at a shirt. Not a t-shirt is a little different because those are partly woven. Um, but like a if you have like a button up or button down shirt or a jacket, just look at look at how the pieces are attached. Look at how the collar is attached to the body. Look at how the shoulders are attached. Look at how the sleeves are stitched. Look at how the seams are all reinforced. Yep. A lot of lot going on. Thank you. Any, yeah. Any more? Um, let's all say thanks. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Um, that was great. And, I, you know, hopefully we can hang out soon. Yeah, I hope so, too. Good luck. I, I saw the Miro boards. It look, looks like some cool, weird stuff is happening. Um, curious to see where, where it goes and what it looks like at the architectural scale. Me, too. <laughs> Yeah, maybe Good luck. maybe you can fly out for a review. Uh, yeah, let, let me know. Okay, for sure. That'd be great. Um, all right. Have a lovely day. You too. Bye. 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 Thanks.